Let's lead right into it. We welcome you all. Let's open in prayer, turn our hearts. Let's go vertical, as we say, because horizontal things happening, right? Let's just identify that. We've got the uh, uh, war, Ukraine and Russia, that in need of prayer. Um, I think legislation such as that in Florida, which want to give parents the primary role in forming their children, particularly in matters sexual, particularly up through third grade. That's a bit of a battle going on. Disney came out. I think in the past couple of days and declared that in the next year, um, they're going to increase dramatically. They're, they're writing in scripts for, um, shall we say, sexual dysphoria, mm -hmm. which is not something for us to necessarily be. Uh, we should be praying, right? We should have heartfelt love in regard for um, the challenges that our culture faces, but certainly meriting our prayer. And at the heart of all of this, right, is that constant theme um, of if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. That family is the cornerstone of civilization. So with that tea, we had truth, not something we can presume to determine, but someone who determines us. We had response, our call to respond to what God reveals. We had incarnational, that this needs to take on flesh. And then we had the end, which is natural. <laughs> And tonight we have I in going deeper into the Trinity of intentional with Father Nick Rao, whom Steph will introduce very shortly. So let's enter into prayer. Thank you, Dennis and Carol, for being put on the spot. God's grace abounds. Let's turn to Him in the name of the Father, Son, yeah, Father, and the Holy, Son Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, together we proclaim that you are love itself. We acknowledge that your love holds us in existence. We proclaim that our marital relationship is the very fabric of your love. Mm. Today, again, we receive the powerful grace flowing from our sacramental marriage, flow heart while you were dying on the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, together with confidence, we bring to you every struggle, difficulty, and challenge. We recognize in these your hand molding us for sainthood the opportunity to sacrificiously pour ourselves out for the good of one another, always without counting the cost, without reservation, that we might become like you. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, together we recognize that our marriage and family is the primary target of Satan, adversary. In your name, we renounce all his lies and whispers, that in any way has held or holds us captive, that in any way has influence right now in your holy name, the name of Jesus, through the powerful intercession of our blessed mother Mary, who crushes his head, we break his chains definitively, completely. Lord Jesus Christ, together in this very moment, we humbly avail our souls anew to you. In this very moment, we pray that you flood us with an abundance of your holy presence, that the authenticity of our faith will constantly shine through ready forgiveness, apology, and pursuit of your magnanimous love. Lord Jesus Christ, together we thank you for the amazing gift you give us in one another, in every way the opportunity to attain holiness, to become what we are in you, to become saints. Today again, we reclaim and declare our marital identity and mission to make you who are love known. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Father, Holy Spirit. Son, Holy Amen. Spirit. Amen. So Greg told me I had to be brief. <laughs> Shocker. Uh, so Father Nick Rowell is from the Diocese of Erie, and I could actually take all of his time for his talk and to introduce him and just the incredible, awesome, wonderful person and priest that he is. But he, correct me if I'm wrong, Father, you're coming up on 33 years. And you're on mute. That's okay. 33 years of um, ordination of priesthood. That's right. Yeah, uh, April 21st. Woohoo! So thank you for that. Um, I could give you this long list that Greg was reading aloud of all of these awesome accomplishments as a Newman scholar and degrees in spirituality and this and that and different positions and studies. Um, but to me personally, just one of my oldest and dearest friends um, that just so much rich history. Um, he was my spiritual director for many years way back in the day. So Greg and I were talking 
at one point many years ago, just so grateful to him for so many things, but it was because of his um, direction and prayer that brought me to my vocation, that brought me to Greg, which brought us our children. And it's caused us- her to survive in her vocation. <laughs> <laughs> Grandbaby. Um, so, so, so grateful for that. But so the history is there, but more than anything, um, you'll, you'll see very quickly that Father Nick um, has the true hearts of a priest, a true hearts of the father, um, a true heart for the church. And just in, in, in that priesthood and in that spiritual fatherhood and in that reflection um, of our father's hearts um, has just touched, not just touched, that's such a cheesy word, but um, transformed and been a conduit and vessel for God's grace and God's love for so many people. So Father Nick, we welcome you and we are grateful to you for joining us tonight. And there you go. I was okay. kind of brief. <laughs> it's good. Okay. You can do fabulous. Yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Craig. So good to be with you and with all the couples who are part of this journey during Lent. Really glad to be with you. I know we just prayed, but to kind of ground me, I wouldn't mind just praying the first stanza, one of my favorite uh, psalms. We we pray it in the Liturgy of the Hours, uh, Psalm uh, 63. O God, you are my God. For you I long. For you my soul is thirsting. My body pines for you like a dry, weary land without water, so I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and your glory for your love is better than life. Heavenly father, be with us, be with all the couples, be with me that we might gaze upon your glory and experience your love in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy spirit. So folks, uh, Stephanie introduced me, maybe where I am right now in this point. I'm I'm in my quarters in the third floor of St. Peter Cathedral Rectory. I'm uh, in residence here at the cathedral in Erie. My uh, work is to work with priests and deacons. I'm the vicar for clergy. Uh, I love my priesthood. And I love uh, the vocation that other men are being called to in their priesthood. And I really cherish the vocation of marriage. Um, I'm blessed by uh, a father who had two wonderful wives. My mom died. My second mom is still alive. So I've been blessed by two great vocational marriages. But in my family, there's been some of the struggle, too, with marriage. So I think, you know, I know the struggles in uh, priestly lives and I know some of the struggles in marital lives. But I also think we keep our eye on the glory that God wants to bring us into in our vocation. So that's enough about me. I just like to, as I begin, maybe go back to the gospel from this past Sunday, the parable parable of the prodigal son, because when Jesus tells that parable, he describes an intentionality in the son, but also an intentionality in the father. It just might be a great kind of uh, uh, jumping off point coming to his senses The man thought, the young man thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? But here I am dying of hunger. I shall get up and go to my father and I shall say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. So he got up and went back to his father. You know, that clear recognition of something good back home. And so he decides to follow that. And then the father, while he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. It's just such a beautiful kind of mutual intentionality of a sinning uh, son recognizing his need for his father's love and the father just ready to welcome him back. And I think this, this, that's a great way for us to talk about intentionality in our Christian lives, about being deliberate, about being intentional in our relationship with God. And so to do that, I want to start with just some images. And I'm going to try to screen share here. Let's hopefully this works. Let's see. There's a story told about three men working in a quarry and they were asked, what are you doing here? And the first man, let's say it's the one on the right. He says, I'm cutting stone. What does it look like? And the same question was asked of the second man, let's say the one on the left with uh, the hammer in his hands. And he says, I'm taking care of my family. And the third one, let's say it's the one in the middle, kind of in the background, maybe a little less uh, ego strong. What are you doing here? And he says, I'm building a cathedral. 
I just think so uh, much. They're, they're three men all doing the same work, but the intention that they have is very, very different from just, I'm just doing grunt work to I'm taking care of my family to I'm building a cathedral. The same exact on the surface work could be happening, but very different intentions. They're all going to the quarry every day, but each one has a different intention. And so you and I, in our Christian lives, we kind of go to the quarry and we go every day, the quarry of discipleship, but what's our intention? So I'd like to talk about three other men. These three men uh, are, this is some detail from three sacred images. This is John, the beloved disciple. Just look at the intentionality in his eyes. He's being very deliberate. He's focused. He knows what he's running after. This is actually a, uh, a uh, detail from John and Peter running to the tomb on Christ, Christ, Easter morning. And, and so the, what's his intention is to unite himself to the risen Lord. And you can see that seriousness in his eyes. Here's another man who also knew Jesus. This is St. Bartholomew. This is, again, detail. It looks like he's just simply extending his arms in prayer, his eyes raised up to heaven, and that he is. But if you backed up from this image, what you'd see is his hands are tied, and a man's in front of him with a knife. And as uh, the tradition goes, that Bartholomew was skinned alive in his martyrdom. But where is he's not looking at the man ready to skin him alive. He's not looking at the, the knife in fear, but rather he's looking up to the father with trust. Here's a third man. Actually, he's with the one that was the master of them all. This is Judas on the left. This is a, a German uh, carving. And it's Jesus betraying, or I'm sorry, Judas betraying Jesus with a kiss. I think in some ways, although we'd love to be St. John, we'd love to be St. Bartholomew, and in many ways uh, we are, uh, sometimes we admit we're a lot like Judas, that we have different intentions kind of competing with one another in our own minds and our own hearts. Did Ju- Judas really know what he wanted? Lent is a time of, of conversion, and, and a lot of us, we focus on moral conversion, that I, I need to stop doing evil, I need to turn away from sin, I need to do good, that's all really good and valuable. And certainly when we, at, at Ash Wednesday, when we received the ashes, one of the formulas was turn away from sin and be faithful to the gospel. So absolutely, one of the purposes of Lent is to really for us to look at what we're doing and how we need to turn away from sin. But I'd like to suggest that Lent is also, in addition to kind of moral conversion, it's a call to a deeper spiritual depth, a deeper conviction, to a purer intention, to more religious surrender. One of the uh, paragraphs of the catechism that I go back to a lot is paragraph uh, 2563. It's one of the early paragraphs in the section on the spiritual life on prayer. And it says that the life of prayer is rooted in the heart. And it says in the mo- in kind of the Hebrew sense of the term that the heart is the deepest center, the deepest part of ourselves. And uh, the catechism says it's the place of encounter, of truth, of decision and covenant. And so when we talk about intentionality, I'd like to talk about intentionality from that sense of what the catechism calls the heart, that deepest part of me when I encounter the Lord, when I encounter his truth, that I have to make a decision and that I'm invited to receive the covenant that he's ready to extend to me. And so I, as, as we t- I talk about that a little bit, I'd like to do the, the following things. I'd like to talk about some tangents or maybe we might even call them mistakes that we can fall into in the Christian life. Then I want to talk about what St. Thomas uh, describes as the intention, which I think there's some neat things there. So a few cautions and then just some concrete advice. And I'm keeping my eye on the clock. So some tangents that we might fall into in the Christian life, all of us, is we might kind of focus very much on my faith journey is primarily a kind of a a journey of feeling, of sentiment. Now, absolutely, our life in Christ is filled with rich and deep and subtle movements of the heart. And, and, And thanks be to God for that. But it's not primarily 
a drive to sensible consolations and just emotional rushes. Our, our intentionality about faith needs to be even deeper than, than those feelings and those sentiments. Some might think that to, to grow in faith is just to learn more and more and more about the Orthodox Catholic faith. We know that our faith is grounded in the commitment to eternal truths that have been re revealed by God and preserved in the church. And we can receive those in our intellect and they are rich and deep and they stretch us and make us grow and they're great. But faith is not just about having the right notions in our heads. It's more than that. It's more than just willpower. It's more than simply kind of what the good that I do and the evil that I avoid. Yes, faith is a commitment, but it's not simply a commitment about what I choose to do or choose not to do. Um, these are it, it, our moral life and the call to observe the moral life in, in our daily lives is really, really important. And doing good is really important. They're, these are essential partners of our faith journey, but they alone are not his essence. Here's Benedict XVI in his first encyclical, Deus Caritas Est. Being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea. It is an encounter with a person who gives our life decisive direction. Benedict Deus Caritas. Just love that. He, he could say such wonderful things so succinctly. So I just, I, as we start here, I just kind of want to make sure that we don't get kind of thrown off on some tangents about what is the faith journey or it is it's deep in the heart it's a mixture of our mind of our will and of our emotions yes and from there we make a choice to receive the grace of god and enter into that covenant with him so what's saint thomas say and we're going to get to very practical and concrete saint thomas says this an intention is an act of the will towards something which the intellect has recognized is good. And so I choose to go in a direction of something that I think is good. It, it kind of makes sense. That's, my, that's the intention that I have. But he also says so, some other things. Um, that um, the, the, it, the will always pursues that which it thinks is good, but our intellect can make some mistakes. Even we, we might think something is good and we pursue it and it actually isn't. But there's something driving us that we always move toward the good. The, the, the addict reaches out for another drink because somewhere deep down inside of him, he thinks this will be good for me. It really isn't, but he thinks it is. So he makes, you know, there, there's that intentionality. There's sometimes you and I might reach out and start to do something that is, is not good for us, but there's something deep down that this will soothe my pain. This will make me feel better. This will somehow achieve some good for me. So we always do it. But the problem is that which we recognize or think is good and we choose to pursue it, that we often make mistakes. St. Thomas says, the passions can warp the intellect and can warp the will. So you and I, sometimes when we're really angry, when we're really afraid, when we're filled with lust, there might be an intentionality that comes out all of a sudden that isn't there when we're kind of calm and steady. That again, the passions can warp the intellect and warp the will. And I think we all kind of can recognize that. St. Thomas says this, that I can intend two things at the same time. Now, he says we can't choose two ultimate ends at the same time because we're going to recognize those, they're going to cancel each other out. But we can intend two related ends, you know, like I want to take care of my family. And so I want to go to work today. You know, they're, they're, they're related. Or um, unfortunately, we also at times can choose, have an intention for two very different things. I want to love my wife, but I'm also interested in this other woman I see, you know, that we can be torn sometimes in a kind of duplicitous intentions going in different directions. Sometimes we priests hear that a lot in the confessional, that there's this recognition of kind of a d desires in one direction and a desire in the other. And sometimes they let their intentions follow through. Follow through. F finally, St. Thomas says that I need to intend the ends and I need 
uh, the end and I need to intend the means. So if, if I want to go to heaven, that's my intention that I need to also start to intend, okay, the means, and we're going to get to that. So there's a lot of rich thought that St. Thomas brings to about this intentionality. I, I, I was thinking of a few scripture quotes. One was, you know, that a passage of uh, St. Paul in Romans chapter seven. Why is it, you know, I, the good that I want to do, I don't do. Uh, and the good that I don't want to do, I do. You know, what is this? Thanks be to God for Christ Jesus. I think that's St. Paul's way of speaking about what St. Thomas says about sometimes we can be torn and our passions can warp our intellect. Okay, so it is important that you and I recognize what's good and make some very clear intentions about going in that direction. As Christians, we have multiple opportunities every day to say, what's good? I want to pursue it. There are some caveats and some cautions that I just want to mention here, and then we'll get to the concrete and practical. None of this gets off the ground in the Christian life without grace. There is a challenge here that we can get, we can rev up our intentionality so much that we forget we're nothing without grace. Matter of fact, when I was kind of poking around a little bit to kind of see what has been said about intentionality, there was actually some, there are some Christians out there, Protestants especially, who get nervous about intentionality because they're afraid if we emphasize it too much, we, we kind of push away the grace of God. They have a point that we can be so kind of focused on what I recognize is the good thing for me to do, and I choose it and I pursue it, that we can forget that we, we all need the grace of God, that the, the Christian life is our work, but even more, it's the work of grace in me. Second, we always need to surrender ultimately to God's will. And this is what I mean. Sometimes, you know, some of us are, are we're thinkers, we're planners, we, we're visionaries, we kind of see in the future, we can kind of see how things are going to go. And it's good. It's in conformity with uh, the teaching of the church and the moral law. But at some point, it just might not fall into place. And maybe it's because we haven't really surrendered ourselves to what's God's will here. You know, there's so many stories about saints who wanted to do one thing and that road was blocked and actually God's will was another direction. There's that little passage in Acts where they were already all uh, prepared to go in one direction and the Holy Spirit prevented them. And actually God's will was that they go in a different direction. So God's grace is essential. God's will is more important than our own. Third, circumstances of our life make a difference. Life happens, right? Life unfolds. We can have some intentionality and then all of a sudden things can change. You know, I'm sure you folks in family life know that every day where you have a plan and then one of the kids is you know, late for getting home from practice or the boss needs you to stick around longer and finish a job and circumstances happen. And they can get complicated. And so we may not be able to follow through precisely on the, the, the plan that we had intended. And we just have to kind of accept that concrete reality of life, that circumstances happen and we need to be flexible. Finally, just I, I think what's obvious is follow through is critical. So many of us, I think, in the Christian, who take our Christian life seriously, we, uh, we, 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 uh, we have wonderful ideas. I'm going to grow in prayer. You know, I'm going to be a faithful disciple. I'm going to lay down my life for my spouse. I'm going to be a great father, mother, etc. And they're good and noble and they're right. But follow through is critical. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Follow through is critical and perseverance. And some days it isn't all that glorious. And so, before I jump into the practical, which I'll do real quick, just it's, a, it's, a, it's the, our minds, our hearts, and our wills recognizes that which is good, and we go in that direction. 
It's always towards Christ. We need grace. We need to conform ourselves to his will, but we're living in this side of eternity. And so we deal with the real circumstances of life, but we persevere. So what does this mean for, for each of us? Once we're in a vocation of life, I think that we can ask ourselves, what's the purpose of my life? And, and we, we all need to kind of customize that in a, in a very personal way. So there are certain things that I think are part of the purpose of the life of a priest. Certain things are part of the purpose of a married person. But it's very like, what's the purpose of my life? The purpose of my life, I think, is to become a saint as a priest in this world so that I can be with God forever. You know, that's kind of the, that's my vocation. That's my purpose. Then we break it down into, okay, what are some goals that I need to work on in kind of the short term, maybe the next few months, maybe the next coming year, maybe this Lent, and kind of make the, the purpose of my life ever more specific. Let me just speak from my own experience. That means I need to be faithful to the divine office. I should have a spiritual director. I need to go to confession regularly. I need to pray every day, you know, in addition to my office, you know, things like that. I have to have these kind of goals that just make sense that help me accomplish my purpose. Third level down is, okay, my daily actions. I need to make sure that my daily actions fit into that intentionality that flows down from my grand purpose in life to the goals that I have in the next few months or, uh, and years. And, okay, what's going to happen today? And we, that's where we need the flexibility and we need to accept the circumstances of life that come our way. And then we need to be ready. So purpose, goals, daily living, and to persevere even when I don't feel like it. There's going to be plenty of days when my intentionality for the Christian life is going to flatten out. It's, it, I'm just not going to feel it. I'm not going to have fervor for it. I, I may not even have a taste for it. And we just need to be ready for that those days will come and have some kind of bare minimum that we'll strive uh, to live by. Next, we need to be very vigilant over our thoughts and our feelings and our desires. This is kind of the, the, an ongoing kind of recollection of our interior life to kind of see what's going on, because it can be such a mixed bag. And sometimes we can inadvertently get kind of pulled aside by some desire or some thought you know, or, or, or something. And before we know it, day after day to day, we're, we've kind of pulled off of the main line of our uh, uh, intentionality and been pulled in another direction. We always got to be responsive and nimble to God's will. You know, what, whatever he wants, as we pray every day so that we might uh, be united with him in this life and forever in the next nine o'clock. Father, fabulous. Um, you, you compacted a five-hour retreat into 25 minutes, which is unfair of you, unfair for you. But um, I think those main elements I am very blessed with in giving us the fundamentals of, of God desires us to have this intentional relationship, the Pope Benedict quote, and just realizing also that in the mess of life, you, we do need grace. And I think the dance, of course, mindful again, this has been great, uh, partnering with us and getting these in parishes, uniting a movement of parents, united in every day praying this prayer. So, Brett and Nikki, if you don't mind, lead us in the prayer. We won't conclude with the, am, uh, with the amen. We'll let Father Nick give us his blessing. And, um, and uh, you're free to go then. And those who want to continue talking. Yeah. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy yeah. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let your holy anointing be upon each of our children, grandchildren, and godchildren this day. In your sacred name, we claim them for you. We renounce all whispers, lies, and influences of the enemy. We pray right now that each know your loving presence, be forged in virtue, and be flooded with an abundance of your Holy Spirit to live fully their identity and mission in you now and through all eternity. Amen. Amen. Father Nick. Let us bow our heads and pray for God's blessing. Mm. Remembering that even when we don't know how to pray for ourselves, the Holy Spirit is deep within us, making intercession for us. 
All we need to do is place ourselves before God. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you all, folks, for being with us. Again, you're not rude for leaving at any time, but we're grateful to have Father Nick return. If any of you have any particular questions or comments on his talk, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I'll dive. Can I dive? You can dive. So one of um, Father Nick's, in his one of his past lives, uh, he worked with seminarians at the, the diocesan seminary in Erie. And so for how long were you there in that position, Father? Uh, total of 23 years. Okay. So you saw a lot <laughs> and, uh, over those 23 years. So I guess my question, I just kind of throw it at you wherever you want to go with it is obviously there's a whole realm of different personalities and yeah. family of origin stuff and whatever. What were some standout points that you might, um, give to us in our families of like, if, if you could talk to their parents <laughs> kind yeah. of moment, do you know, do you get what I'm asking kind of, so it's open enough where you can go with it as you will, but what were some key standout things that would be helpful, you know, that you experienced over those years in the formation of guys who discerned out or continued mm -hmm. to be called to the priesthood? Yeah, that's a good question, Steph. And what comes to mind first off is the, uh, families that prayed. And by that, I don't mean necessarily any particular form, but that the young men grew up in a home where mom and dad, especially dad prayed. And mm -hmm. I say dad, because we, we just know that sociologically, the, 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 the secular uh, folks are telling us this, you know, mm -hmm. that when a young man sees his father bow down his head and pray, that impacts him in such a way that, you know, we all need to humble ourselves. And, but I just ran into seminarians who experienced that prayerful union in a lot of different ways. Second, um, these guys came from imperfect families. We're all imperfect. Uh, and I just, it, so there's no, it isn't the, the perfect family. There's no perfect family. So that's, those are not the families that are yielding young men for seminary. Mm -hmm. It's just people who are struggling to do their best with love and faith. Uh, maybe the third thing I'd say would be just realness and authenticity mm. of life. Mm. Um, that those those men seem to be best equipped. They they kind of come in with resilience and spiritual grit, mm. and you know can um, withstand some of the disappointments that might come along the way, and don't expect seminary and priesthood to be kind of this neat, ideal, clean, pure experience for them that, you know, as, as priests, we walk into the mess of life. And, and so they need to be equipped to do the same. So if they've had some experience of just walking into the mess of life in family and that it worked out okay, that's good. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. Awesome. Those Thank are the you. things that come to my mind. Just a comment out of our group. Uh, as we asked, went around and asked the question at the end from Father Nick's talk, what is an area that maybe you're chewing on that you'd want to make a commitment in, that you maybe are called to knowing that you need to cooperate with grace, but you know you need resolve and perseverance and you need that grace to lean into. And I think there was a common sense, everything you just sort of said, deeper prayer life, longer prayer. We have very prayerful people in our, in our group, but just a mindfulness of that value. Um, and I... I sort of suggested that I think all of us are very much in need of a kind of community and parishes should be that place, but in absence of the busyness of a pastor, not judging or, or pointing fingers, but we as a lay faithful are equipped, appointed and anointed to bring together couples that might be an occasion to strengthen us over time. Uh, whether it's once a week or once a month, that families, two or three, it doesn't need to be a big group, but the value of gathering together with a specific intent of fostering the things you said. Um, here we have a group through Zoom. It's imperfect. We kind of inherited this habit through COVID and that sort of thing, but there's a blessing of being connected to people across states and such also. I don't know if you want to comment at all about just, you know, your, your years of ministry and pastoral life of just maybe an encouragement or a punctuation of the importance of maybe couples and families making commitments to one another and really going forward and the value maybe you've seen in your own life of that. I think that uh, we're all torn in different directions in this contemporary culture that we live in. 
And I, it just, my experience is that married couples with kids are, they're, they're pulled in so many different directions. Many of them are good. You know, a few things maybe are corrupt, but many of the, the things that are pulling them in different directions, they're good folks are good things, but I, th- this is, it's the, kind of the failure of making priorities and, and that falls to priests too. So that's, that's not unique to married couples, but I think, I just think it's so important to pray prayerfully prioritize within our full humanity, kind of what do the kids need? What do each of you need in your married life? You know, to kind of bring your robust humanity to that discernment, but then really prioritize. And then mm. maybe not in a, you know, overly strict way, but in a pretty persistent way, like this is important to us. You know, those are the, because I think otherwise we're going to get yanked into the maelstrom of, you know, sports and uh, academics and friends and this and work and all these other things. And, uh, those aren't bad. It's just, I think when a, when kids come home, don't they need to know what's the most important thing for mom and dad, you know? And if, if mom and dad aren't clear, um, it isn't going to just kind of somehow magically descend upon the kids. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to put too much emphasis on, on mom and dad, but I, I think if, if, if moms and dads can be really clear about what the priorities are in the home, and not just on doing, but on being. Mm. You know, the kind of person to be, you know, the, the virtue. I love these prayers that, you know, the forge virtues, I think, is part of the prayer that we just ended with. Mm. You know, that, that that's a priority for our family is to be, you know, to forge virtues together by forgiving each other and by challenging each other and encouraging each other. That, uh, that, that's really rich. So it isn't just a priority of doing, it's a priority of being and, and character development. Uh, long answer. Great answer. That's what comes to my mind. Yeah. Thank you. I, I can make a comment along those lines, Father and Greg and Steph. We're up in Rhode Island, and um, gosh, at least 15 years ago, we had a newly ordained priest come as an assistant pastor who asked Sharon and I to start a parenting group in the parish for young families. And over the years, we had, you know, certainly different people coming in and out, but there was always a group of six core couples in it. And we would meet once a month, but it was our safety zone. We mm-hmm. we would, uh, whether it be reading a book or a chapter of a book and then having discussion points of, around it, but the most fruitful time was when we could come up and talk about the issues we're having with ra- raising our children in this culture, in this culture. Yeah. And, or, and what are other people experiencing? How have they dealt with similar situations? And this core group of six couples are, you know, just so thick today. We, I was ordained last year, a deacon. So I got assigned to a new parish, but um but it, it truly was such a blessing for us to for us. have that. And knowing it was coming from our church and like-minded couples, and it was phenomenal. We had it our for at least 15 years, I would say. Wow, what a gift. What a gift. It was a gift. It's awesome. With no one else, Brett, I wanted to put you on the spot, and you can plead the fifth if you want. In so many words, the good can be the enemy of the great. So you have a very faith-filled family, the Seymours, you have a lot of kids in your family and you're very soccer oriented. So uh, it's complicated. We have eight children. Um, we have six still at home and we have, I don't know, we have four that are still playing travel sports right now. Mm-hmm. And it is difficult um, because society doesn't know that things should stop on Sunday. Right. And it is challenging. Um, and we, as being in some of that secular world and things that you do, um, it is difficult to figure out when do we say enough is enough. Um, we we use it as as an advantage though when we travel for sports. We find different churches in in communities that we can attend, so we always figure out a way to go to mass. Um, but it also affords us an opportunity to be in different churches, and it it marks that importance to people to say, 
hey, we're going to mass. You know, tonight, as an example, I was invited to go to dinner with people from my office. And I said, well, I can't go uh, because my wife and I are doing this prayer group. And, you know, the secular world kind of goes, well, that's kind of strange. But we say, well, it's not really strange. It shouldn't be considered strange. Um, and I think is when you're in sports and you do these things with your kids, you just have to find that balance. Uh, but it is challenging. Um, and we have kids that are still not in bed yet tonight. So uh, that was a so challenge. Do we. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but mine's crying and yours isn't. Uh, that's true. <laughs> well, we don't know. <laughs> Father, I really enjoyed the image that you used early on when you showed the three uh, quarry workers. Yeah, yeah. really and what had resonated with me, you know, a lot of us work in professions or in the work world that's mixed with people doing the same thing as we are. But, you know, if we put that twist on it and have the intention that you're doing it, for Christ or you're doing it for the betterment of, you know, mankind and whatever it is you're doing, you know, that, that can make all the difference in how you approach your work yeah, exactly. and how you deal with the challenges that come along. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you for that. It was a, it was a great image. Yes. Good. Thank you. Father, before we land, which I'm very grateful for you sticking around, I want to ask you a consequential Greg question since we're so blessed to have you tonight. And, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be right if I didn't ask you a hardball question. Yeah. yeah. He, he wants a hardball question. <laughs> um, no. So our church right now, how would you, you're, you work for the bishop. You have worked at Gannon. You're a professor. You've taught. You have a wide range of experience in our church. Just how would you give us insight to this moment in history? Maybe some of the key challenges that we face as Catholics Maybe some of the pontiff questions that may be lingering in people's minds, challenges, the, the political situation. As you pray through these things, is there a prominent one, two, or three promptings or things that the Spirit keeps reinforcing to you for Catholics who are trying to navigate in this wilderness? You experience the challenges in confessionals. You experience it with people. What are prominent messages on your heart that the Father would want to say to us? How is that for a softball question? I am blessed at the cathedral that uh, since it, it, by the nature of the cathedral, it draws everyone. And it's really impressed me of the, of the value and the importance of sacramental unity. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds kind of high and mighty, but that mm -hmm. when we come to a sacrament, we really got to drop uh, the unimportant, un, you know, non-essentials and really strive for unity. Um, and I know that, you know, that, that has a certain practical thing, you know, a, a unity with regard to how mass is celebrated. But I, I mean, even more just we it's it's so beautiful when we're coming together post covid in prayer mm. and for mass. And I'm just I, I don't think we should underestimate the importance of just being together as a community of faith. And we and I think one of the evils that's creeping in is just the stirring up unnecessary distinctions that mm. turn into divisions. Mm. So some distinctions are need to be acknowledged, but I think the enemy is using them to divide us. Just, okay. I'm going to ask one more super quick. It's an easy question. You, you um, use the word perseverance a lot in your talk, just as a reminder, just to keep persevering. So in closing, um, what are some words of encouragement for persevering? Cause so many of us have, you know, reach that certain point and it's like, oh, right. Or, you know, like in our small group too, we talked about the whole follow through and how so many of us get, you know, through all these things and then come to the follow through and just fail. And yeah. so what are some in closing again, because we don't want to keep you all much longer, but um, encourage us, father, encourage us, lead us. So Let's learn something from uh, AA. You know, every day is a new day, one day at a time. And so persevere today, you know, follow through today. And if I if I screwed up yesterday and didn't, okay, today, let me, I, I think we really need to kind of awake each day, arise each day and say, okay, today I want to be faithful to, to those uh, and, and be intentional today. Second, I think um, as far as perseverance goes, I think, and I often say something like this in, in to penitence and confession, you don't see all the good that is being accomplished by your fidelity. Mm. So just trust that 
your fidelity is bearing fruit somehow, somewhere. God will not waste it. So our perseverance, if we just kind of keep looking like for outward metrics or visible metrics, is my perseverance kind of doing, making any difference? That's only half of the, the, the reality. The other half is unseen. And, and we need to trust that, that our fidelity day after day and picking up our little crosses and persevering in those yields things that we can't see. Father, deeply blessed. Our, th- our gratitude is going to be a good day with the Schleters and your EPA, restaurants of your choice, that. favorite beverages. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have some good prayerful conviviality mass. We'll do it up. And we're very blessed <laughs> to have great. priests like Let- you that we can do that with. That'd Since be the great. fireplace days are gone and you didn't avail yourself to that because we know you have nothing else going on. <laughs> you can go out here and join us. But uh, we do uh, are grateful for this fellowship of all of you who are here. And we pray for God's continued blessing. And until next week, God bless you guys. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much.